On today's Prophecy in the News, we're going to talk about the last trumpet. That trumpet that men will hear one day and the dead shall be raised and the living will be changed. In fact, we have here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Well, we're going to talk about that trumpet. Gary Stearman has written a, an article for our March 2009 Prophecy in the News magazine entitled, The Clarion Call. Mm. And we're going to discuss the various trumpets in the Bible and what their significances are. So stick around. Gary? Well, J.R., this is uh, an ongoing conversation among Christians. Let's put it that way. There are uh, good men of the faith out there who differ about uh, what the Bible refers to as the last trump. And there's a continuing discussion between those of us who believe that uh, the trumpet uh, of the rapture blows prior to the tribulation. Others contend that it's the seventh trumpet uh, blown by that seventh angel in the book of Revelation. Therefore, uh, we're talking about a, uh, a mid to late trib rapture in that case. And so the discussion goes on. Well, I wrote this article entitled The Clarion Call uh, in an attempt to show what I believe that the, the trumpets are two in number. They are the voice of God the first one blown at Mount Horeb, that is the Sinai experience when Moses and the 12 tribes were gathered at the mountain. The last trumpet in the, uh, uh, well, it's in 1 Corinthians, it's 1 Thessalonians. It is pictured in the New Testament as the time of home going for the church is not a trumpet blown by any entity, but rather it's the voice of God himself. So we have, in effect, bookends. Mm -hmm. We have two trumpets in Scripture, one at Mount Sinai, one at the rapture, and, and they are both the voice of God. And with that little statement, let's go, go ahead and, and talk about uh, some uh, interesting historical trumpets. Now, Gary, on the Arch of Titus, there are two trumpets depicted. Mm -hmm. Tell us about those two trumpets and their history. Well, it's, it's fascinating. The Arch of Titus, and by some miracle, and I'm sure that it's God's own intent, the Arch of Titus remains standing to this very day, and it's said to be the only heroic arch of its type still standing in the world. And what a miracle that it has on it, a picture of the Temple Menorah, a picture of the Table of Showbread, and a picture of the two trumpets, uh, which were looted by the Romans, paraded back to Rome, and of course in a, in a triumphal uh, procession uh, uh, in which General Titus himself uh, proudly stood at the head of the parade, uh, we had the temple loot. Now the question came to my mind, why would those three items be picked for display by the Romans? I think the menorah as a symbol of the spiritual life of Israel and the table of showbread uh, are obvious choices. They would want to parade those, but why did they parade the The light two? and the bread. Yeah, the light and the bread. And they, they knew about how those things operated in, uh, roughly in the, in the days of the priests. Why would they have picked the two trumpets? Well, if we go to uh, a little historical account uh, written by Alfred Edersheim in his book called The Temple, he describes the daily life of uh, the people who were officiating at the temple in the t at the time of uh, Vespasian's uh, first siege. And at the time when the Romans occupied the city of Jerusalem, J.R., those trumpets, uh, it's hard for us to imagine in this day, but those trumpets marked the passage of the hours in Jerusalem. There's no place you could go in town when you wouldn't hear those trumpets day and night being blown mm -hmm. by the priests. And the priests advertised the fact that those trumpets proclaimed the kingdom of God. Now, if you're a Roman and a good worshiper of Caesar, you wouldn't like that at all. That those trumpets would be pesky noises that you would like to get rid of. And, and, the, and to you, they were a thorn in your side because every day there's a reminder you know, like three times a day, those trumpets were blown, and, and it was just a daily reminder that the kingdom of God was present. Well, mm -hmm. you didn't want the kingdom of God to be present because you worship Caesar. 
So for the Romans to destroy the temple yes. and carry the booty back to Rome mm -hmm. and to sell the Jews as slaves on the slave markets of the world, um, to depict these three main entities from the temple, the menorah, the seven golden mm -hmm. lampstand, the table of showbread, and the two silver trumpets was their way of saying God is dead. That's it. You've got it exactly. And so that's why we have those, those symbols on the Arch of Titus. Those two trumpets, J.R., are, are metaphors. They are uh, an eternal type of the will of God who speaks uh, through those two trumpets. The first trump, the last trump. First trump at Mount Sinai, the last trump when at the home going of the church. It, it, it's, if you will, a set of bookends around uh, the spiritual life of this planet during a time uh, of, of really of horrible um, injustice, during a time when uh, the world is under the control of the institutions of the world system controlled by Satan. And yet there are those two trumpets as bookends. So that's the setting. And Edersheim said, uh, describing <clears throat> the blasts of the trumpets, he said, uh, even the posture of the performers showed this, by this he means the proclamation of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> For while the Levites stood at their desks facing toward the sanctuary or westwards, the priests with their silver trumpets stood exactly in the opposite direction on the west side of the rise of the altar by the table of the fat and looking eastward or down on the courts. On ordinary days the priests blew seven times, each time three blasts, a short sound an alarm and again a short, uh, a sharp short sound. Or as the rabbis expressed it, an alarm in the midst and a plain note before and after it. And according to tradition, they were intended symbolically to proclaim the kingdom of God. So there it is. Romans walking around, patrolling the streets below. Uh, the people going about their daily business. And the priests up there on that temple mount. One of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Proclaiming the kingdom of God with their trumpets. It's hard to imagine how irritating that must have been to the Romans. <laughs> and to the world at large. So, this is the reason why they picked those trumpets to be on the Arch of Titus in Rome. Exactly. And they're there depicted to this day. Indeed. Are they still around? <clears throat> well, uh, J.R., they went back uh, a, a bit uh, ago, perhaps five years ago. Uh, a letter was written from the desk of the Prime Minister uh, in Israel to uh, officials of the Roman Church demanding the return of the Temple of Menorah. Mm -hmm. which it was said still to be in their possession. Uh, why would that menorah be there? Well, it would be there because uh, Titus in Vespasian brought it back and it became a part of the official booty of the looting of the temple and then later on uh, would have been stored by uh, the people who founded the Roman church, apparently. The, uh, the Jews think that, that it's still there. If it's there, the table of showbread must be there and also the two silver trumpets. Mm. Well, the uh, Pope's going to Jerusalem for a little visit here pretty soon. Uh, do you suppose he might bring it back? Well, if he did, it would be a historic event. It would be absolutely <laughs> astounding, wouldn't it? It would be astounding. But don't hold your breath till Don't he does. hold your breath. I see. Right. <laughs> so well, let's talk about his, um, Exodus chapter 19 and the day the first trumpet sounded. Um, the people heard it, they were frightened by it, and finally told Moses to tell God, please don't do that again. Tell us about well, that. Well, absolutely. And, and J.R., the, the setting is this. Uh, Exodus 19, verse 1 says, In the third month, when the children of Israel were gone forth out of the land of Egypt, the same day came they unto the wilderness of Sinai. And then it says that they... Uh, came and camped at the mountain. Now, this is the third month, the month of Sivan in the Jewish calendar. And then if you skip over to the 15th verse of Exodus chapter 19, it says, uh, And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives, that is, dedicate yourselves to spiritual matters, 
And it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings, a thick cloud upon the mount, and the voice of the trumpet exceeding loud, so that all the people that was in the camp trembled. Now this is called a trumpet, but it's the voice of the trumpet, and elsewhere at J.R. we learn that it's the voice of God that sounds like a trumpet. Now this is not an angelic trumpet nor is it a silver trumpet being blown by a priest. It's not a human trumpet. It's not an angelic trumpet. It's the first trumpet in the Bible, and it is the voice of God. So if we get our definition straight, it's going to help us to understand the trumpets. The first trumpet, voice of God. It's my contention that the second trumpet is also the voice of God, the second and last trumpet mentioned. And by the way, it's the trumpet for which we uh, are eagerly awaiting. Uh, we, we, we want to hear that trumpet. And uh, we believe that when it sounds, it's going to be a voice sounding. It's going to sound um, perhaps like a trumpet talking. And you know, J.R., we live in the day of computer synthesis. Now, in the days of the disciples, when the Bible was written, it's very hard to imagine a trumpet that sounds like a voice. Today, we could just set up a little computer and set up the voice of a trumpet and, and uh, enunciate words through it, and it would sound like a talking trumpet. And so we can kind of get some idea. Uh, I'm not sure we really know, but, but the closest to the writers of the Bible could come to it is a trumpet that's, that's, that's making words. I don't have any trouble imagining that at all. Okay. Now, in Revelation chapter 4, John says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was, as it were, a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, mm -hmm. and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. So, the trumpet was the voice of God. Right. Is that what you're saying here? That's what I'm saying. And, okay. and in so, other words... In other words, it's not a shofar, not a silver trumpet. Right. It is actually literally the voice of God. It's the way God sounds when he talks. That's the closest I can come to it. Uh, you and I have a particular voice. If I speak, you recognize the sound of my voice. If you speak, I would recognize the sound of your voice. When God speaks, it apparently sounds like a trumpet. Does and this personally, mean it's loud? Loud. So when and God speaks, it's loud. <laughs> it may be loud and maybe musical in some way. Uh, mm. uh, you know, I can't even imagine, but I can't wait to hear it. <laughs> but it's not, and I want to say this again, it is not an angel blowing a horn. Uh -huh. It's not Gabriel. It's, mm. it's the voice of God. Well, let me tell you, the article is in our March 2009 edition of Prophecy in the News magazine, and we want you to get it so that you can read the article for yourself. JR, let's briefly go back now and talk about how the two silver trumpets came to be. Back in Numbers chapter 10, uh, we read, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole piece, shalt thou make them, that thou mayest use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journey of the camps. Notice that these two trumpets are not trumpets of judgment. They are trumpets of assembly. They are herald trumpets designed to make sure that people move where they're supposed to go. And I think after reading very carefully that they are the they are archetypes of the two big trumpets in the Bible. That, that move the people. Uh, one brought the law, the other will bring an end to the age of grace. They are both the voice of God, but, but these two trumpets of silver blown by the priests are called uh, Hatsotsera, uh, meaning metal herald trumpets. The same word or the same idea is conveyed in the New Testament by the Greek word salpinx and uh, salpinge or metal trumpets are blown by the angels in, uh, in heaven, in Revelation, when they prepare to bring judgment down upon the earth. But never do we find a, a metal trumpet, if you will, being blown to signify the taking home of the church at all. It just simply is not the case. Or the raising of the dead. Exactly. In John's Gospel, chapter 5, Jesus said, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice and shall come forth. And so this is at the resurrection and the dead will be raised, not at the sound of a trumpet, 
listed here as his voice. So the trumpet and the voice seem to be synonymous here. In, in fact, to me, the best way I can say it is that uh, God's voice simply sounds like a trumpet. If you were to hear it today, uh, and you went to tell your friends, I heard the voice of God today, and guess what? It sounded something like a trumpet. Not exactly, but something <laughs> like. Uh, that's probably as close as the writers of the Bible could come to it. So what about the last trump, Gary? Well, the last trump is not the seventh trumpet of Revelation mm -hmm. uh, for the very simple reason that it's not the voice of God. If you turn back and when the seventh angel sounds, it precipitates upon the earth this cascade of judgments called mm -hmm. the vile judgments or the bold judgments. <clears throat> and that is its purpose. The, the seventh trumpet is purposefully blown to rain down upon earth the, the greatest judgment in the history of the planet. Uh, there is no indication that it is the voice of God. Quite the contrary, it's called the voice of the angel. Mm -hmm. It's called, actually, it's the trumpet of the angel. Now, when we come to the book of Revelation and study it, we have chapter 4, where John sees God mm -hmm. sitting upon his throne. This is a Rosh Hashanah event. The, the rabbis have written for oh, centuries and centuries ago that God one day will sit down upon his throne of judgment and take the books, the book of life, the book of death, and he will open the books. And so this, in chapters 4 and 5 of Revel and 6 of Revelation, seems to be a Rosh Hashanah event. Mm -hmm. Well, Rosh Hashanah, that is Tishri 1, the, first, the new moon of September, is typically the time called the Feast of Trumpets. So, John sees these seven angels come forth, and prepare to blow their seven trumpets. Mm -hmm. So evidently he is describing a Rosh Hashanah scene here. And those seven trumpets are not trumpets that, that wake the dead. Mm -hmm. They call down the judgment of God. Exactly. Now going back to the seventh trumpet, which we were speaking of a moment ago in Revelation eleven fifteen, It says, and the seventh angel sounded... And there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So this seventh angel is sounding, and, and J.R. in the Greek it says, And the seventh angel trumpeted. It uses that, that verb, uh, salpinx, uh, salpinge, which means the seventh angel blew a trumpet, as we think of a trumpet, a metal trumpet. Mm -hmm. Now, this is an entirely different thing than what you run into in 1 Thessalonians so 4. this is not the resurrection. It's not the resurrection, because if you read about the resurrection, it says the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. In other words, it's not the angel. With the voice of the archangel, Mm -hmm. and with the trump of God. So here we have something entirely different. We have a, an archangel not blowing a trumpet, but rather uh, shouting instructions, I think. He, he may be something like a giant conductor. Uh, can you imagine millions of resurrected saints going to heaven in, at, in one moment? I think that there's going to be an angelic, if you will, uh, choir director, somebody who's, who says, this group's got to go here, this group's got to go here, you go here, you go over there. I think it's going to be one of the greatest traffic jams in the history of heaven when all the saints go up. And so the voice of the archangel seems to me to be a, uh, a directive voice, but it's accompanied by the trump of God. Now that would be the voice of God, as we have already seen. Not a metal trumpet, but it would be the voice of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first at that point. In other words, it's the voice of God that raises the dead, and it's not an angel blowing a trumpet. Mm. So when we come to the seventh trumpet here, we find the angel blowing the trumpet, and then the nations are angry, and uh, verse 19 says, The temple of God was open in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So this sounds like a um, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement mm -hmm. event here. 
So we start out with Rosh Hashanah and we're moving through these seven years of the tribulation period and we finally come down to the seventh trumpet and it is the day of atonement. Mm -hmm. Now that's the day when Jesus comes back. You remember Ezekiel chapter 40, mm -hmm. the 10th day at the beginning of the year, he sees the glory return. Right to the Mount of Olives, and his voice was the sound of many waters. It, I remember, and it's a voice. It's not a metal trumpet. Now, here's, here's another thing. A moment ago, we talked about the priests blowing these trumpets uh, during the services, 24-7, uh, basically. Every day of the week, uh, at different times of the day, they blew these silver trumpets, and according to Edersheim, uh, according to tradition, to tradition, and I'm quoting, they were intended symbolically to proclaim the kingdom of God, those priestly trumpets. So we go back to Revelation, the seventh trumpet, and guess what's happening? The seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. So the role of that seventh angel in Revelation is the same as the temple priests. It's declaring the kingdom of God has nothing to do with the church whatsoever. So, Jesus is about to return. Indeed. Which we see in chapter 19. And as this angel sounds, then, seven angels step forth from the Holy of Holies in heaven with bowls of wrath. Yes. And they begin to pour out their bowls of wrath upon the earth. So evidently, the judgment that God pours out upon the earth is toward the end of the tribulation period and Jesus is about to come back and put a stop to the battle of Armageddon and save the day. So to sum up, uh, those two silver trumpets on the Arch of Titus stand as a memorial to the two trumpets of God uh, and we think of them as his voice. His voice at Mount Sinai uh, which initiated the period of law and his voice, which we're waiting for on a daily basis, which is going to say, come up hither, it'll terminate the age of grace. Two great trumpets of history, and they are symbolized by those two trumpets on the Arch of Titus. Mm. Are you ready for those trumpets? Hey, let me tell you, are that trumpet? I believe that he's coming one of these days very soon. It could be today. And if you don't know Christ as your personal Savior, you need to trust Him. You need to ask Him to forgive you of your sins and save you. All you need to do is just pray a simple sinner's prayer, something like this. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I know that you died to give me eternal life and to pay for my sin debt. I'm asking you right now to come into my heart and life and save my soul. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll pray that prayer, or one like it, you don't, it doesn't have to be those same words, but out of a sincere heart, if you will ask the Lord to forgive you of your sins and to save you, He will, you know. He loves you. He came 2,000 years ago to die on Calvary's cross for you, to pay the price on your sins. And He wants to forgive you. All you have to do is ask Him. You know, he won't cram salvation down your throat. He cannot forgive you unless you ask him. But if you'll repent of your sins and ask him, he w is more than willing to give you eternal life. Gary, hmm. I'm waiting for that trumpet. J.R., so am I. And I want to say just a quick word to somebody out there who may be on the verge. If you haven't made your decision for Christ, when the trumpet blows, according to 1 uh, Corinthians 15:52, it'll be in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. That's the voice of God saying, come up hither. When that happens, there won't be time to make your decision. It's going to happen that fast. You need to make your decision right now. In the twinkling of an eye, like they said at General Electric, that's 11 hundredths of a second. <laughs> right. That's pretty fast. <laughs> it is. So... I'm J.R. Church, that's Gary Stearman. We appreciate your watching today, and we say until next time, keep looking up. Jesus could come between now and then.